Why am I here talking about post-conditioning at a preconditioning meeting? And so let me try to explain <coughs> a, a little bit about um, uh, post-conditioning and why uh, these are actually quite uh, closely related. This, this is a, a picture from uh, a paper by uh, 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 Jake Fenton Johansson's lab. Uh, it's dated 2003. And this was actually the paper where post-conditioning was introduced to the world. Now, um, what we're looking at here is uh, infarction, cell death, of the myocardium after a period of 60 minutes ischemia. So this is really a model for a patient who has a, a thrombus in a coronary artery, uh, is taken to the hospital, and uh, has the thrombus removed either by a thrombolytic drug or uh, today a uh, catheter. So he's had a period of myocardial ischemia and reperfusion. So the blood flow's been uh, established. And unfortunately, uh, these patients can't get to treatment soon enough to prevent a, a fairly large amount of uh, infarction of the heart. And so they've lost muscle uh, this is dead muscle, it won't regenerate, and so this patient's going to have a compromised uh, contractility uh, for the rest of his life. And uh, if this is large enough, if he loses 25%, he will develop heart failure. Now, <coughs> this is uh, preconditioning, and in this uh, experiment, uh, they occlude the coronary artery for five minutes. That's sublethal, it won't hurt anything. Uh, the patient would have angina and it would be uncomfortable, but uh, nothing, no permanent damage. You reperfuse the artery for 10 minutes and then give the 60 minute occlusion. And lo and behold, the infarct size is cut in half. So this is pretty dramatic. And uh, this uh, caught everybody's attention. It was first introduced by Bob Jennings in uh, uh, 1986, 30 years ago, and uh, everybody who tried to reproduce this got the same result. So this is great. Uh, this, this is what the patient clearly needs. Now there's a small problem with it, and that is that you have to pre-treat the patient. And so uh, you're going to see the patient somewhere in here, and so you don't have that luxury. And so this thing sort of uh, languished uh, in terms of translation, but uh, everybody could see the, the, the power of it, and the question is how, how could you possibly translate it? And, um, and so Jake Fenton Johansson came up with this. He said, well, if, if we put the uh, ischemic periods, and some people use more than one, they, they might use two or three. In fact, Jennings actually used four five-minute periods of occlusion Turns out one's uh, sufficient. Uh, how about if we put them at the end? And Jake experimented with different protocols and came up with this one, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, do it three times, and lo and behold, he got almost the same result. So um, <coughs> this is pretty good, and this caught everybody's attention because this obviously is, is doable especially patients who are getting reperfused with a balloon catheter, you could simply inflate the balloon uh, and deflate it three times before you uh, took it out. So now preconditioning, that's pretty simple. You, you've got two periods and uh, it turns out that uh, a five minute occlusion is as good as a 10 minute occlusion, uh, just as protective. The uh, two minutes, is uh, the minimum for a rabbit. If you go down less than two minutes, you won't get any protection. Uh, five minutes seems to work for, for most species. The reperfusion period can be anywhere from one minute to 60 minutes. Doesn't seem to make any difference. After that, the uh, effect wears off. So you've got about a 50 minute time period here where the heart is in a protected phenotype. <coughs> so. That's, that's pretty simple. Uh, it didn't take long to get what everybody 
figured was a pretty optimal preconditioning. Uh, rats like at least two periods of this. Uh, one period won't do it, but two or more will. So pretty easy. Now, if we're going to go into a clinical trial with post conditioning, obviously uh, we need to uh, be able to be sure that we give these patients something that ought to protect them. Uh, and so the question is, how do we get the optimal protocol for post conditioning? And this gets more complicated because you have reperfusion times, ischemic times, numbers of cycles. Um, should these uh, cycles be symmetrical? Should it be uh, uh, same time off, the same time on, or should you have more time on, more time, less time on? Um, what frequency should they be? How long should they last? And how many cycles should you have? Uh, and so uh, empirical attempts to define this protocol really varied from species to species. And um, obviously to try to work out an empirical protocol for humans would be uh, uh, pretty uh, uh, difficult, obviously. Uh, so w if we're going to try this in humans, we ought to figure out something that ought to work the first time. So the question is, can we take a theoretical approach to this protocol? Can we figure out from a theoretical basis uh, what's going on? And the answer to that is uh, we can get pretty close to it because uh, after 30 years of study of uh, preconditioning, uh, we have a pretty good idea how it works. And um, it turns out that uh, it looks like the mechanisms are the same for both of these. And so let's take a look at these mechanisms. First of all, this, this is the uh, just uh, unprotected ischemia. Here we have... Um, the pH of the tissue down here, and this is the time, so we occlude here. Uh, we notice that there's some uh, uh, autocoids released, adenosine, opioids, bradykine, and so forth. We'll, we'll look at these in a minute. But when we reperfuse, uh, it turns out that uh, these my mitochondrial permeability transition pores open in the mitochondrial uh, inner membrane, and these uh, kill the mitochondria and in so doing uh, kill the cells. So not all the killing, but a large chunk of it is due to these transition pores. This was uh, actually uh, first proposed by Andrew Halestrap back in the uh, 1980s. Uh, nobody paid a lot of attention to it, but uh, as you'll see in a minute, it turned out to be uh, uh, spot on. Okay, here's the precondition. Now, what's going on? We said we had these autocoids that come out, and they, through uh, signal transduction pathways, fairly complex pathway, end up activating protein kinase G. And uh, this is interesting. It turns out you can precondition just fine with Viagra activating the PKG uh, pathway. Here we then, that uh, phosphorylates a uh, site on the mitochondria, which opens the mitochondrial ATP-sensitive potassium channels. And that happens during this ischemic period. Now, why do we need this reperfusion period? If I didn't have this reperfusion period, I'd obviously have, uh, Instead of 60 minutes, I'd have 65 minutes of occlusion. That would make things worse, not better. Well, it turns out that what protects the next step in this pathway is protein kinase C. And that has to be activated by a redox reaction, redox signaling, where a uh, oxygen, uh, reactive oxygen species, we don't know exactly what it is or wh even where it is other than it's in the mitochondria. It turns out that opening the mitochondrial KTP channel activates this step and it needs oxygen to supply the redox, the uh, reactive oxygen species. We'll show the evidence for that in a minute. So really, this is to 
provide redox uh, signaling, then that, that somehow is remembered all through this uh, ischemic period. When you reperfuse, uh, it goes through a pathway here showing it uh, changes the affinity for an A2B receptor, we believe. Uh, it goes through PI3 kinase and ERK, just as uh, uh, we saw with um, uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, talk this morning, same uh, similar pathway. And this uh, ends up inhibiting the transition force. So the trigger is this adenosine redox signaling, very important. And uh, the end is to prevent these guys from opening up. Now notice I show here the transition pores are inhibited during ischemia. They're inhibited because uh, pH, low pH, will inhibit these transition pores from opening. And so they don't open until you reperfuse. When the pH normalizes again, now all the uh, conditions are, are right. There's elevated calcium, there's uh, free radicals around, and they will cause these pores to open. And the, the, uh, the mitochondria have, <coughs> have been injured. Okay, so now let's look at post-conditioning. <coughs> Whoops, back up. Okay, now we're not going to look at post-conditioning. What we're uh, the other thing is uh, on this one is remember it's the lack of oxygen that is the difference between this and this. Okay, so it, it's that we don't. We, it's stuck at the KTP channel. It can't go any further. The pathway, it's trying to, but it's stuck right there. Okay, what's the evidence for this redox signaling? Well, this is an ex experiment from a, a paper we published uh, a few years ago. And here we look at, um, here's our preconditioning protocol. This is the... Um, amount of, um, uh, of a free radical scavenger, uh, MPG, mercaptopropanyl glycine, in the tissue, and this is the uh, protocol for giving it. So we start, uh, this is an isolated heart, it's got a coronary artery uh, tied off, and we start the propanyl glycine during the uh, ischemic preconditioning period, obviously none of it's going to go in uh, to the ischemic zone until we reperfuse here, but it'll quickly load the tissue so there'll be lots of MPG in the tissue during ischemia. Here's one where we do it um, during the ischemic period. We, we uh, pretreat with the MPG, load the tissue, and then as soon as we uh, reperfuse, we stop the infusion and wash it out. So this is MPG during the reperfusion period. This is MPG during the ischemic period. And here it is here. We'll start it just before we uh, do the uh, index ischemia, the prolonged ischemic period. We'll give it just long enough to load the tissue and then clamp it. So these are the, the protocols. And finally, We'll see what happens if we reperfuse with deoxygenated buffer. No, no oxygen in the buffer. So here's what the uh, data looks like. This is infarct size here. Here's our control. This is the preconditioned. And you can see uh, in this case here, we're using a, a 30 minute occlusion period, so we get a tremendous amount of protection almost no infarction at all. This is in rabbits, by the way. Here's the MPG during the 10-minute reperfusion phase. You can see a uh, uh, big infarct, we completely blocked the protection, showing that this reperfusion phase, it was sensitive to this free radical scavenger. We stopped the redox signaling. If we have it during the ischemic phase, it doesn't care. We still get the protection. And if we have it um, during the index ischemia, the long ischemic period, still doesn't care. Now, if 
finally, if we reperfuse with the deoxygenated buffer, so there's no oxygen present, then it's as if we gave not 15, uh, 30 minutes of ischemia, but 45 minutes of ischemia. We actually make the uh, thing worse. So I think this is uh, good evidence that this is redox signaling going on and requires oxygen uh, to do it. Okay, this is the post conditioning. What, what's going on here? Well, <clears throat> what we're going to do here is during the uh, index ischemia, of course, we're going to get up to this point. We're going to uh, get the uh, uh, mitochondrial KTP channels opening and they're saying, okay, it's time for the redox signaling. Now, if we can give these intermittent off and ons, we can end up with an, a low perfusion rate that will keep the pH low. Okay, we're not fully reperfusing them. It's half on, half off. But it does allow enough oxygen in to supply this redox signal. And so we can finish the pathway and if we do this long enough, instead of the transition pores opening, because they're uh, inhibited by the low pH, what we'll do is put it in a preconditioned state and um, block the transition pores. And you can show that you can block this with a blockers to adenosine, opioid, bradykinin receptors, PKG blockers, um, KTP channel blockers, uh, PKC blockers, A2B blockers, et cetera. Any, any of these will completely block the protection. So uh, that we, they, they do, in fact, seem to be the same phenomena. Now, how about this pH hypothesis? Well, here we are. Uh, this is isolated rabbits again. Um, now we're going to uh, look at the infarct size. Here we're going to post condition with six cycles of 10 second periods. So that's um, two minutes of, of uh, post conditioning. And you can see it's quite protective, about the same as we saw with the uh, uh, preconditioning. We're going to post condition with only three cycles no protection, it's, lo it's lost. So that we have to have more than 60 seconds of, uh, of this reduced flow. We have to maintain it, that we uh, stopped the cycles too soon and uh, we restored the flow, normalized the pH before the animals' uh, were, hearts were protected. Here's, uh, instead of cycles, let's do acidosis. Now we're going to raise, uh, lower the pH by raising the CO2 level in the uh, buffer. So take it down to about uh, 6.7. And you can see that two minutes of acidotic reperfusion was just as protective of six, two minutes of uh, staccato reperfusion. So again, showing that acidosis is the key here. One minute of acidosis would be the same as only three cycles of post-conditioning, uh, not protective. And if we delay the start of the post-conditioning protocol for one minute, give it full reperfusion for one minute, again, we've lost our protection. Why? Because the transition pores opened before we could put it into this post condition state. So this gives us uh, now some, some uh, let's see, where are we here? Um, okay, and this, this shows uh, that this really is the same thing as, as uh, preconditioning. Here we're doing the acidosis, two minutes protected. Two minutes of acidosis plus the free radical scavenger, we lose the protection. Redox signaling. That's, a, that's critical here. Might okay TP channel, uh, you block those with 5-hydroxydecanoate, same thing, you lose the protection. Uh, PKC, inhib uh, PKC inhibitor, chelerythrin, 
loses the protection. So it's the same signaling molecules as we saw in preconditioning. So that confirms the redox signaling hypothesis. Um, it turns out that uh, <coughs> even though the post-conditioning phenomena um, was, was a, a real re revelation uh, in uh, 1993, in fact, uh, it had been around for a while. And um, this is a paper from uh, Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery in 1986. And uh, Gerald Buckberg, who, um, this is from his lab, he had this thing called gentle reperfusion. And what you do is you reperfuse for the first 40 minutes at a very low perfusion pressure to limit the flow. And you can see that he got some uh, cardio protection. The infarct size was, in fact, reduced in those papers. Now, the problem with that is that when you reduce the perfusion pressure, try to reduce flow by reducing the perfusion pressure, the forces in the ventricular wall will redistribute the flow away from the subendocardium. So if you look at, this is uh, uh, pre-ischemia. These are the flows across the wall. Uh, let's see, where, I'm sorry, pre-ischemia. They were here, 68, 60, 64. Uh, nice uniformed from the epi to the endo. But when they reperfused with the gentle, he had 73, almost normal flow in the epicardium reduced flow in the mid-myocardium, just right, but the endocardium, poor thing, it didn't get any flow at all. So uh, that obviously is not going to be very uh, effective. And so how do you reduce the coronary flow uniformly to all uh, of the heart muscle to keep the pH low but still deliver some oxygen? Well, you use staccato on-off reperfusion all the way on, all the way off, and do it rapidly, and that solved the problem. And that was where uh, Jake Vinton Johansson really made the contribution. And as you notice in that last slide, Jake was in fact uh, a trainee in the Buckberg lab when he was doing the general reperfusion studies and is on many of those papers. So staccato, on off. So all right, here's the theory. If the periods are equal, then the mean flow will be 50% of full reflow, and that seems to work. So uh, equal on-off periods uh, so far has been good in all the models looked at. The reflow period should not be long enough to normalize the pH. If they're too long, the pH is going to normalize, like we had with the one-minute reperfusion. Uh, before we started the on-off cycles. And uh, the transition pores are going to open. It's going to kill the, the heart. So the shorter, the better. That's easy. Just keep them short. And we find uh, uh, in rabbits and rats, uh, 30 seconds works pretty well. Uh, 10 seconds is even better. Well, not really better. It just it works as well. One minute was too much for a rabbit. One minute uh, wouldn't do it, as you saw in that uh, paper. And the cycles must continue until the heart's fully conditioned. If Remember, if we stopped the uh, cycles after one minute in a rabbit, that wasn't enough. It wasn't protected. We had to do it for two minutes. And two minutes seems pretty good for rats and rabbits, but... Here's pig, look at the pig. Four minutes times 30, that's, that's four full minutes of uh, cycles. Didn't do it. Eight did. So you needed uh, eight minutes for a pig. So what do we do for a human? That one we don't have an answer for. We've, we've got to do empirical study. And here is, is a study done by uh, Michel Ovis group in France, published in 2005, data was collected in 2004. Um, they said, well, let's try three cycles of one minute. 
So that's six minutes of cycling. They used one minute periods more, more for um, practical terms. Uh, they've got a catheter in there, a lot going on. Uh, they thought, well, let, let's, let's do one. The cath guy said, one minute we can handle. We can uh, do that all right. And so uh, they used one minute. It seems to work. Here, here's the, the data. Uh, all the, uh, this is infarct size uh, versus the ischemic zone size. They measured the size of the occluded field of the occluded artery. And they got a... Uh, fairly good correlation. The black solid circles are uh, control and the uh, red circles are post-condition. And uh, 30, I think 36 patients in this uh, study <coughs> and uh, clearly a, a very robust uh, protection. And notice that um, these are the guys that are in trouble. These, these are the guys with the big risk zones, the left anterior descending uh, thrombi. And um, the guys with, these are the ones that will benefit the most. The guys down here, they just sort of all mix up together, very small infarcts. Uh, so just what we're looking for, patients with big ischemic zone will benefit the most. Now, <coughs> we can um, sort of standardize this so we can compare it to other studies by using a weighted standard mean difference an analysis. And that shows uh, over here, here's no effect, bigger infarcts over here, smaller infarcts over there. And uh, pretty r robust responses as we'd predict from the paper. Now, this is from a meta-analysis by uh, Favoretto in American Journal of uh, Cardiology 2014, a couple years old now. And here are um, 11 studies done to try to reproduce the original STAT study. And you can see uh, a lot of these uh, were negative. Uh, a few showed a very small effect. And nobody um, could reproduce this magnitude of protection as seen in the original uh, STAT at all study. And so, uh, okay, the question is, why couldn't this trial be reproduced? And we noticed that the, this study here, less than a fourth of the patients got uh, a uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, that'd be like clopidogrel, a, a platelet inhibitor. Uh, all these had 100% coverage with platelet inhibitor loaded before the uh, artery was reperfused. They give them a, a, a large, they're all oral dosing, uh, usually preferably in the emergency room, uh, be enough time to uh, get platelets inhibited before the uh, vessel was reperfused. So the question is, uh, could these be interfering with the post-conditioning? And uh, this is from a, a, a study in, in 2009, shows the difference between clopidogrel loaded and aspirin only. This is survival. And uh, you can see that uh, there was uh, one year survival in these patients, all cause mortality. But this clopidogrel almost cut the mortality rate in half. And this is large studies. This is a couple thousand patients in each group by just giving them a uh, loading dose of clopidogrel before you balloon the artery. Now, notice that these guys are dying. Uh, obviously, there's some in-hospital death. There's some early mortality. And they're continuously dying over the year, exactly what you'd see with um, uh, with uh, uh, heart failure due to loss of myocardium. And um, now th this was attributed to um, both uh, maintaining stent patency, but of course that wouldn't affect out here. That would just affect the first uh, few weeks of uh, reperfusion. And the other is, is that, well, maybe these 
reducing infarct size because the patients have microemboli in their coronary arteries, and so we're improving reperfusion. But um, it's possible that this stuff is a post-conditioning mimetic. And all the patients who receive it become post-conditioned. They're in a post-conditioned phenotype, and therefore giving a second post-conditioning stimulus would uh, not have any effect. So that it's not that, that post-conditioning wasn't working in the subsequent trials, but rather the control patients were also post-conditioned, and therefore we couldn't see a difference. So. Uh, we, we were working with a Cangrelor, a P2Y12 inhibitor that's very nice because it's injectable, it's not oral. And uh, we noticed that in our rabbit model, it in fact was very protective. As protective, this is giving Cangrelor just before reperfusion, and it looks just like post conditioning or pre conditioning. And notice here, these are inhibitors, Wartmanin, uh, this LY uh, PI3 kinase inhibitor, PD98059, an ERK inhibitor, an adenosine receptor blocker, another A2B adenosine receptor blocker, uh, MPG, the Ross inhibitor, KTP channel blocker. Every one of these could block Kangalore's protection. The same pathway that preconditioning uses. And more importantly, none of these blockers interfered with Kangalore's ability to pre prevent platelet aggregation. So, you know, our conclusion was that this protection was coming from the preconditioning pathway, not from anticoagulation. So I think this is very powerful data that this stuff is a preconditioning, a postconditioning mimetic. It works at reperfusion, uses the same pathways. And we saw the same thing for ticagrelor and clopidogrel. Same, same behavior. And here's the most important slide. Uh, this is uh, rabbits getting postconditioning. Here's cangrelor alone, postconditioning alone, and combining the two. If anything, it made it a little worse. Over here's Kangalor and preconditioning and the combination, no added benefit. So, again, even if it's not exactly the same mechanism as pre or post conditioning, you sure can't add them together. So, here's the thing, we would say then that the problem is the platelet con uh, inhibitors are already conditioning patients. They're saving lives. It works great. But um, post-conditioning, uh, I think you're, we're wasting our time trying to give that to patients now. Platelet inhibitors have rendered post-conditioning redundant. And obviously, finding the optimal protocol for humans is no longer possible. They're all protected already. Uh, nor is it relevant. Um, the recent cyclosporin trial, uh, cyclosporin just inhibits the transition pores directly. It's a, again, a post-conditioning mimetic. Uh, it showed n no benefit to these PCI patients. However, if you look at the data, 25 of those patients with an LAD thrombus, left anterior descending thrombus, either developed heart failure or died in the following year. So we still have 25% of these patients that need help. So uh, more protection is absolutely needed, and uh, we're, we're not, we can't rest on our laurel, laurels yet. And what we need to do is figure out what's killing the heart muscle that the platelet inhibitors can't protect. Some, something's killing this tissue. And um, a clinically relevant post-conditioning intervention should be able to further limit infarction in a patient in a platelet-inhibited treat treatment animal. So if we want to find such an intervention, we have to put a platelet inhibitor in our control group.
That's, that's the, the bottom line. And uh, I wouldn't be telling you this if we didn't have a uh, idea of something that might work. And this is uh, uh, a possible mechanism might be pyroptosis caused by pro-inflammatory mitochondrial DNA that escapes from a um, necrotic cell and kills its neighbor, therefore causing spreading necrosis. And what does that mean? When you have a, a catastrophic event like ischemia, ischemic necrosis, where the, the cell is uh, very quickly killed, the mitochondria are killed along with them. They burst with these transition pores. They release uh, their DNA. And the body detects mitochondrial DNA to be bacterial DNA. It's, it's uh, very similar in the uh, structure and uh, sequence and re, uh, starts an inflammatory response, which then would kill neighboring cells. And this is uh, one way you could uh, protect against this is simply giving DNAs, uh, IV DNA protein uh, at reperfusion. And what that will do is uh, degrade any extracellular DNA. And here we see um, this is our control. Here's uh, Cangrelor, very protective. Here's DNA alone, also equally as protective. If we give DNA with the ERK inhibitor, it doesn't block its protection. It says that it's not the same as preconditioning. And if we combine these two together, we get additive protection. And so I think the, the future is to look for this kind of behavior and this kind of drug and go on beyond uh, what the uh, uh, platelet inhibitors uh, do by themselves. And I think that, and because it's given at, reper at reperfusion, uh, we think that uh, uh, should have some clinical potential. And my last thing is that if we're going to continue looking for cardioprotectants, uh, you have to test them in animals treated with a P2Y12 inhibitor to model today's patients. Okay, I'll quit there. <laughs>